today, I want to announce some upcoming events. Um, one is we are working with uh, the Department of Commerce to have Assistant Secretary Strickling uh, come speak about the administration's privacy policy. Hopefully that'll be lined up for the first or second week of April. Um, likely in May, we'll have on two separate events, two professors from Stanford, uh, Bruce Owen and Greg Rostin will be coming to speak. Uh, Professor Owen will be speaking about one of my favorite topics, corruption. And uh, he's, he's writing a, a, a very long piece that may very well turn into a book on this very topic about what, uh, what creates corruption in Washington. Um, today, we're very fortunate to have with us uh, David Ripken, who is uh, a, a frequent uh, contributor to the Wall Street Journal, has served in uh, uh, previous administrations in high positions uh, in a variety of, of very important positions. Um, it's very important uh, to understand uh, the Internet today and in the future to understand some of the important laws that uh, our government has. Um, a little over 10 years ago, uh, forces of evil were conspiring to attack the United States. Uh, these were, in many cases, uh, little people, little evil people, determined to do evil, and they used the Internet to empower themselves to attack the United States. In the aftermath of 9-11, uh, Congress passed and the President signed uh, several laws to help uh, counteract the forces of evil. Uh, among these laws were the Patriot Act uh, and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, over the past decade, uh, Mr. Rifkin has been um, the most articulate and the most uh, consistent defender of these and other laws that enable our government to protect America. And so it's a great honor to have uh, David Rifkin, come speak at the center. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Harold. I hope I can live up to my billing, especially since I feel uh, I consider uh, somewhat discomfited, as most lawyers, I think, better on my feet. But there's no uh, there's no podium to stand. So I'll, I'll try to uh, be as uh, as loquacious and intelligent while sitting down um, as possible. Actually, Harold had introduced it well. We are talking about forces of evil, and of course, uh, a, a brief and, and, and rather obvious observation about 9-11. Uh, nobody, uh, well, let's we'll just say that the vast majority of American people prior to 9-11 and our political elites did not appreciate the gravity of the threat we faced, and therefore, again, a very obvious observation we did not have in place the national security infrastructure as well as the legal architecture, which is essential in a democracy to meet the threat from entities like Al-Qaeda, uh, our counterterrorism operations, and again, the, the laws uh, and the regulatory um, implementation of these laws under which they're operating produce you know, counterintelligence uh, uh, and counterterrorism operations that were limited in scope uh, with numerous impediments to the most effective combination of resources uh, among the agencies running it. One of my favorite examples is that prior to 9-11, believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, the government operated numerous databases, or I shouldn't say the government, different government agencies operated different databases that did not talk to each other. And, you know, this was by way not, not by accident. Many Americans felt at the time that this was the right balancing of national security and, and civil liberty imperatives, um, in large part because a lot of Americans uh, part of our uh, national makeup and our political history are suspicious about the government being too efficient and, and too powerful. That, of course, fundamentally changed with a 9-11 attack. We find ourselves propelled into a war we did not seek but had to prosecute and continue to prosecute to this very day. And one of the things that had to be done, aside from the resources, dollars and cents, and personnel, is a significant updating of the key authorities under which the government operated. And the one I uh, will spend a few minutes talking about in particular is the 
is a so-called Patriot Act. Um, the effort uh, um, to put it out began almost immediately after 9-11, had to involve Capitol Hill, again, consistent with our constitutional system, where it is Congress that prescribes for statutes the bulk of executives' um, powers, particularly the ones can be brought to bear uh, within the borders of the United States. Um, and I think there is very clear consensus after 9-11 and long before the various investigations took place. And we can talk a little bit about about that if you're interested, but pretty much everybody understood that the, the legal authorities and the, uh, the institutional architecture we had was inadequate for two or three basic reasons. A, they were designed for the more traditional Cold War environment rather than uh, dealing with very insidious um, groups that actually could do something that heretofore could only be done by sovereign states because not to use too fancy the word Al-Qaeda and 9-11 projected power and attacked us in a way have not been attacked since Pearl Harbor. The notion that a private organization can do that was, was something that folks did not appreciate. The second, so we had, the, again, the legal infrastructure and the institutional infrastructure that was ill-designed to cope with this threat. The legal authorities we had in place and the bureaucratic mentality did not permit sufficient coordination and data sharing um, between the law enforcement and, and the intelligence personnel. And, and again, it was not because they were evil or stupid, but if you look at the way in which classified data was handled, need to know and various other things, you have people working in the same agencies were very much siloed, uh, and that was a problem in terms of intelligence assessments, but there's also very much a problem on the counterterrorism side. And the second was the relative paucity, if you will, of, of the tools available to our counterterrorism folks. And again, not I don't know how many of you appreciate that, but we're talking about tools that the law enforcement folks dealing with drugs and, and God forbid, uh, healthcare fraud had uh, had quite routinely, and I don't mean to diminish uh, the problem of, of drugs and and, um, and um, healthcare fraud, but they certainly don't rise to the level of existentialist threat. But the uh, the counterintelligence side really did not have those tools, which I'll describe in a more detail in a minute. So um, very clearly, both political branches understood that the system needed to be modernized, and uh, they very quickly enacted this package of authorities called the Patriot Act. By the way, one of the reasons it was done quickly, so you don't think that our political branches are that superhuman, is because most of the legislative language has been available uh, on the shelf, drafted by the um, by a number of, of career lawyers in the Clinton administration, DOJ. And the reason they've done that is because they were troubled by the fact that you had, again, the counterintelligence side that did not have, explained in a second, a rolling wiretap is, um, and they kind of wanted to get it done, but there's no political will and probably no political opportunity to get it done, so you had this this legislative package sitting on the shelf. Um, so the original Patriot Act was passed, and Carol and I and a couple of uh, colleagues were talking about it uh, before, before starting here. A remarkable lack of rancor. I mean, it was almost unanimously. I think you had a few folks in the House and and, and one person in the Senate uh, who voted against it, but I frankly don't remember the precise numbers. And of course, the legislation uh, led to a real enormous change in the way in which we dealt with uh, with terrorist threats. Um, one was, and I just mentioned it about the, the tools that the uh, criminal side had before, but counterintelligence side did not. Uh, one of them is. Uh, under Section 2 or 6 of the Patriot Act, uh, you now have uh, the FISA court, which is a special court sits in Washington, prized of, uh, by designation of uh, federal judges that allows the issues of so-called, actually not called warrants, they're called orders, to authorize roving surveillance, which is the piece of paper that permits the government to maintain a seamless surveillance coverage uh, if the person you're targeting switches from one device to another, uh, one communication device to another. And again, that uh, the, the folks who dealt with drugs and, and thugs have had that authority since 
second half of 1980s, but the National Security site did not. Um, likewise, Section 215 of a Patriot Act, uh, that also something that originates out of a FISA court, gave the counterintelligence uh, personnel an ability to compel the production of business records and other tangible items, which, again, is, is comparable to have a longstanding and traditional tool of the law enforcement side that is an ability to get um, such items with a grand jury subpoena. And, and by the way, again, business records, are I'm not to pretend to be an expert in intelligence. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, though I dealt with intelligence matters in my government days. I mean, the, the reason business records and various other things are important is because one of the greatest advantages to the bad guys is we live in a free society. We don't carry we, you know, papers, the Germans call papier, and we don't, uh, our borders are fairly porous, um, and, and you know, it's easy to move money around, it certainly used to be. But on the other hand, if you think about it, as you move through the modern world, you, you cannot help but leave footprints. It's like the way in which hunters used to track their prey in the prehistoric times. You saw footprints in the snow. People leave footprints in our daily existence, and it turns out that bad guys leave kind of distinctive footprints. So if you can assemble a lot of, uh, of uh, information from third parties' books and records, and you can analyze them, crunch them for very sophisticated algorithms, there would be some telltale signs, again, not to stretch of analogy too far away, a good hunter would discern whether it was a caribou or, or some other animal trudging through the snow. So being able to obtain those records, it's, you know, including the much maligned, remember all the stories kind of subside a little bit now about how you know, evil government would be looking at the library records to see what you're reading. Um, not heard much of it now, but it's fairly stabilized, including things like library records. These are not because of some kind of uh, insidious curiosity on the part of a government type, because it, being able to assemble all those records does give you that ability to, to track the bad guys early on. Now, um, the other thing that the, uh, uh, the Patriot Act did was uh, reduce evidentiary thresholds for um, things like the 215 letters and something called National Security Letter, which is essentially um, unlike the 215 uh, orders that originate out of a FISA environment, the National Security Letter, um, in effect, is a form of administrative subpoena, also gives... Um, the government an opportunity to uh, to uh, get third party records and uh, be able to remember the famous expression about connecting the dots early on. Um, another thing that the Patriot Act did and may strike you as fairly mundane, it uh, reduced the number of erstwhile burdens that previously kind of made things a bit more cumbersome. So the Pfizer uh, wiretap orders could now be longer in duration and the Authority to issue NSLs, national security letters, which I just mentioned, instead of being done by a fairly small number of lawyers at the headquarters, uh, could now be done in field offices. And, you know, enabling uh, counterintelligence uh, folks to obtain um, to obtain uh, search warrants for electronic communications that were not judicial district specific, but could be in effect, served in any judicial district. Now, it's kind of a little bit in the weeds, but trust me that the, these types of enhancements actually make make considerable difference. Uh, the, another thing that the Patriot Act has done, and that probably is, is a little bit more impressive uh, from a layman's perspective, is that it shrunk, and I don't want to say completely destroyed, but it shrunk uh, a very real wall, actually used to be called wall, between the law enforcement and the uh, and the national security side. There was really a, a set of procedures, some of which are something I used to write about considerable gusto in the times it was being debated. One of the reasons it was being debated, ladies and gentlemen, as you may recall, there were, as always, whenever there was a disaster, be it Pearl Harbor 9-11, the investigations, and then you know, different parties try to find the culprit. And the wall was, was fingered as the culprit, as the culprit, because we had, uh, uh, actually, I forget, kind of remember his name. It's been a while ago. We had one particular character in custody, including his hard drive, and uh, did not get searched. And had it been searched, what's up? Is that correct? 
been uh, I've been preoccupied with other issues in the last few years, um, and so the, the, the range of choices was the, the culprit, one of a major culprit. So big debates about the, the wall uh, and how robust it was and why it came about. But it was, a, in effect, a set of rules and procedures that really, I'm not exaggerating, prevented the intelligence side from even talking to the uh, law enforcement side. That wall grew out of a language in FISA that indicated that in order to be able to get a FISA warrant, you had to be able to demonstrate to the FISA court that the purpose of the order, the purpose, that's the precise statutory quote, uh, was the uh, collection of foreign intelligence. For a variety of reasons we can get into uh, where, you know, some unfortunate situations, some of which involve judges and some of which involve bureaucrats from the executive branch, some of which involve oversight folks in Congress. But that statutory provision of language, the purpose, began to be interpreted to mean the primary purpose and the way in which, um, after some unfortunate run-ins between the FISA judges and their permanent staff and the counterintelligence community, um, the way you demonstrated to a FISA court that collection of intelligence and not law enforcement was the primary purpose is you basically had people who worked in the FISA world who never talked, would not meet with the, uh, with the law enforcement folks in order to make sure that the FISA judges would not suspect that there is some improper effort to use the FISA order to benefit the, uh, the law enforcement side. And that really you know, had idiotic situations. Idiotic even in a pre-9-11 world where you had the counterintelligence folks tracking one guy for intelligence reasons. The same guy was, you know, because look, no surprise, you look at the 9-11 conspirators and, and similar types. They come in, they commit wire fraud, they commit bank fraud, they lie every time they fill uh, any paperwork, including such things as renting houses. So there's, you know, they just like, remember I mentioned a few minutes ago, they, their footprints, one of the footprints they make, uh, they produce a lot of uh, things that violate criminal laws. So they frequently come to the attention of law enforcement community. So you have two sets of folks focusing on the same targets, never, never talking to each other. Now that situation was substantially eliminated in the Patriot Act by eliminating the primary purpose test. And, and, the, and the new language was it was sufficient that if it was uh, the, the intelligence collection was significant purpose of the order that you sought, and it expressly authorized, I would say, more more genial communications between the law enforcement side and the national security side. Uh, as a result, we have um, fairly shortly after 9/11. Uh, had really everybody talking to each other, which seems like a, a very reasonable thing. So you had the law enforcement side talking to the intelligence side at the federal government level, and equally importantly, you had the, the federal uh, uh, intelligence and law enforcement community talking to the state and law enforcement, state and local law enforcement types, of which there, I mean, numbers vary, but I've seen. You know, well over half a million, probably closer to uh, 750,000 talking. And if these people know what you're looking for and you share information about various leads you develop, perhaps based upon overseas intelligence, have some wonderful synergy that, uh, that takes place. Uh, and all of it, of course, was directed towards making sure we don't have another 9-11. Now let me briefly bring you to the present. Uh, one of the consequences of getting there Patriot Act out in 45 days with remarkable uh, absence of rancor and lots of bipartisanship. It's kind of tragic as a quick aside that it, it takes a very tragic affair like 9-11 to produce levels of, of bipartisanship uh, that we've seen in the Patriot Act. That's kind of a high price to pay, but on the other hand, at least I'm glad we're capable of that level of effort. Um, but one of the things that Congress did while passing that package is they, they sunset it. So um, it was set to expire in 2006. As we got into 2005, uh, there were fairly extensive <coughs> hearings and discussions uh, looking at each piece of a Patriot Act piece by piece to see if abuses were, were not uh, uh, conducted. Or, uh, And as you may recall, this was in early on in the Bush, well, it began really towards the end of Bush's 
Bush 43's first term and into uh, uh, beginning of Bush 43's second term. Lots of, at that point in time, things were not bipartisan. Lots of lots of finger pointing and, and vilification. Lots of stories uh, in the New York Times and various other mainstream media outlets about their abuses and how you know, people use national security letters with, you know, some dots were not, uh, 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 some things were not dotted and some T's were not crossed and how um, this was all terrible. I'm really glad to say that again, maybe because the Patriot Act is such a common sense thing that nothing significant was taken off the table in 2006. You, all the authorities that I talked about, the removal of the wall, ability to have new tools uh, that you did not have before were available to the law enforcement side, refining existing tools, all of it stayed, and all that was added were some, let's say, um, good government you know, um, provisions that required um, Required the executive to provide great opportunities for IGs to to look into those matters on a regular basis. Um, probably the only real significance was the addition of, and again, I'm, I'm both uh, a defense and national security hog, but I also believe in individual liberties. So I'm not sure on balance whether it was that bad of a thing. Uh, but the recipients of the third party record directed. Uh, orders, which could be a 215 or a national security letter, could now challenge it in court uh, because before they could not, there was a non disclosure provision. Because it would make sense. Somebody you know, thinks that you're a bad guy and they go to your bank to get this information about you. It would not be kosher if your bank told you about it. Um, so now they can challenge that in court. Um, but the, the balance of the Patriot Act was not disturbed. And I actually would, would finish by pointing out that's where we are now. There's really not much uh, controversy about how the Patriot Act is working. And the system rose to vacation, did a good job. Um, I wish it would be true in all the other instances when we talk about the post 9-11 legal architecture, but it's, it's, it's working pretty well. And I think that in the future, if there is some shortcoming, some gap, and the intelligence community with the support of the whatever whatever sitting administration we have would come to Congress, I think they would look at it favorably. I got too optimistic. Depends on what precise point in time in our political cycle we're talking about. So it's it's kind of a success story, in my opinion. Well, let me um, let me stop here and see if uh, we can talk about some other issues. Let me let me follow up. Um, when you mentioned the reauthorization in uh, 2000. Five and six. Uh, wasn't it also just reauthorized last year? Totally non event. I mean, at least in my view, but again, I wasn't coming to testify, but just judging from the relative lack of attention in the media. Yeah, the, uh, by the way, Harold, the fact that Congress sunset, <coughs> sunsets these provisions at periodic intervals is not a bad thing. I frankly think. Mm -hmm. Most of the emanations of administrative state, including most of our uh, statutes in the environmental and other spirit, is upset. So we can come back and re-examine the fundamental validity of the policy bargains that they reflect. So I, I, I don't, I don't want to chastise Congress. But it seems like it was a very, uh, very partisan issue in 2006, and last year it was much quieter. It was. I, again, it was not a partisan thing yeah. at all in 9-11, uh, post-9-11. It was fairly partisan um, in 2006. Again, I don't remember the numbers, but it certainly didn't pass by such uh, super majorities in both houses. And it was partisan, but it wasn't terribly partisan in 2006. Yeah. Enough Democrats. I mean, it wasn't pushed through for Republicans only. It wasn't, I mean, to me, the, the super partisan thing would be you know, the Paul Ryan's, you know, Medicare reform. It was not nearly as bad, and, and the fact that we have things now, and we talked about a little bit before before coming down here, we now have what I call a Obama-only exception to a lot of criticism, which is to say the folks, I call them the, the privacy crats, probably. Summarize it's not a very, uh, it's not a term of endearment, but, but folks who feel that privacy, and uh, absolute form of privacy, 
I think is unattainable unless you live in the woods and don't communicate with anybody is the overarching constitutional virtue should be enforced no matter what threats we face. These folks have not sort of intellectually disarmed, but they've been quiet. So they still criticize the Obama administration, actually in press releases, but they don't get as much play. But it's going to change if and when the Obama administration departs. So some of those 2006 atmosphere would, would reemerge. I think. I could be wrong. Could you discuss a bit about um, national boundaries and extraterritoriality of laws on the government, laws on the Internet, such as uh, FISA and the Patriot Act? Um, the Internet doesn't recognize national boundaries all the time. and uh, There are issues about, uh, for instance, where information is stored and, and the ability to reach that information. How do you see those issues playing out? Uh, good question. I would say, Harold, in, in my view, and by the way, I don't represent anybody in this space, so I'm not burdened by the uh, uh, concerns that a lot of uh, disciplines in the Internet bring to the table, so I'll try to be as, if I have any problems there, just biases, not, not client views. But I think there are two fundamentally different issues. One issue is to what extent the U.S. government in the course of conducting counterintelligence or intelligence and law enforcement operations should be able to utilize the, uh, uh, the, the internet. The answer there is we have a proper oversight. There are no boundaries. Uh, one of the things we've benefited enormously, for example, in the FISA world is because, I don't know how long it's going to last, but because of the uh, superior quality and sort of a sheer density of our infrastructure, turns out, and I'm not telling anything new, it's all been written about numerous times, something like 40% of worldwide communication flowed through servers uh, on, you know, on the U.S. side, because the way it works, I'm not an engineer, but basically you cannot choose what path the information flows, but it tends to choose all things being equal, sort of a less congested paths. That's a great tool, the fact that we can we can access this information, uh, it's under our territorial jurisdiction is a good thing. To the extent we can uh, gather information, uh, again, using properly authorized techniques overseas, we should do that. I mean, I don't think there's any country in the world that would not do that. And I certainly know what our Chinese friends are doing in Augusto. Um, and, um, you know, the Russians are doing it still, but they're in such a pathetic shape that not really as as, uh, as, as, as active in that space as they used to be during the Cold War. Um, so there, you know, again, with appropriate oversight by Congress, by the two intelligence committees, and you know, some judicial engagement, and we can talk if you're interested about such esoteric issues. As, you know, what kind of FISA orders do you get? Do they have to be person-specific, or can you have group-specific uh, orders and whatnot, uh, patient-specific? You know, leaving those as a take to the side as much information as we can carry. That's our relative advantage. That, to me, tell me if the analogy makes sense, on the intelligence side is something comparable to the drones. That's sort of our advantage um, over the bad guys who otherwise operate in a modern society where it's easy to hide. Uh, where I'm, I'm much less aggressive when it comes to the regulation for purposes of you know, revenue raising or um, or other forms of, of regulation. I think that um, there, uh, if we're talking about things that transpire outside of our territory, there are a couple of tests that uh, the courts have utilized and Congress has enshrined in some legislation. So you, you have to, as a, uh, as a threshold matter, extraterritoriality is not presumed. I mean, that's actually not my view. That's the Supreme Court's view. As for cases like Morrison, that had to do with a reach of, uh, of, uh, of one particular uh, statute, uh, one particular statute having to do with securities fraud. Um, but the court has branched out in that direction in regard to other statutes. So first you need to have a Congress. Uh, in ca Congress, to say very clearly, but a given regulatory statute is extraterritorial. Um, and second, so if it doesn't say so, you cannot go and regulate things beyond our borders. And the typical test that um, Congress is using Dutt Frank as a perfect example is 
uh, you need to have something that has a significant impact on commerce and uh, in the United States. Now, frankly, as being as a lawyer, significant impact is a very Weasley test, fairly easy to satisfy. But I, I, I would not be pushing. I don't know if I'm answering your question, no, but I would not be pushing aggressively to. And by the way, another example which is dear near my heart because I care about the First Amendment, the whole libel tourism business, which is a perfect example of the view that we have the world fully integrated net. So if you publish a libelous communication, you know, in uh, in the United States, but it gets downloaded and, and you know, reachable, accessible in London, you can be sued in London. As some of you may know, Britain has very different libel laws than we do. And um, actually, the Brit English, British Parliament has taken some steps to ameliorate the problem, but it used to be for years that everybody used to come and, and sue uh, uh, folks and show their First Amendment rights in London because it's expensive and it's very easy to get, uh, rather easy to get judged. The, the counter side of that is uh, to the extraterritoriality is that um, there have been increasing news reports about foreign governments discouraging companies in those countries from storing information in the United States precisely because of the fears that um, the information would be, become discoverable by the, by the American government. Um, you heard of anything like that, or is that a concern to you or not? Uh, to be honest, I've not heard that, uh, that particular requirement. I've heard other requirements that, of course, folks like Google and, and, and Facebook when others are faced, which is if you operate in a foreign country, and frankly speaking, something which is not bad judgment in a forereign government, but let me pass a little bit of a judgment and say in a non democratic environment that they have to be willing to provide not just access to the local government, but a shortcut, which I think is a very bad and cynical. Uh, and some of them have held up that pressure. I did not hear that there is specific requirement that you do not store things. I, again, I'm not an engineer, but I don't even know how you would do that. Uh, it's a lot of, I mean, unless you have a very secure environment, right? I'm wrong. You really have no control over uh, you can You can download things to the service, but the notion that you could just prevent the information from flowing elsewhere, how would you do that? Well, I can tell you on the telecommunications side, uh, mergers over the past 15 years have almost all had requirements that companies store information physically in it. It's just a, a, a long term part. storage? Yeah, okay. permanent storage. Uh, um, and, and, and which foreign governments again? Not be I, <laughs> I, I'll have to go find the, the news accounts on it. I thought it was somewhat. Crazy, but, uh, but presumably not. We're not talking about a democratic so Oh, actually, no. I think it probably would be because those are the only places that actually have company. <laughs> uh, There's a whole other effort again. We were talking about it a little before, re related to internet governance. Which again, it's not my, my area, but there's only one thing worse than uh, this regime where multiple governments can uh, analyze data that flows across boundaries which is reachable. I don't know if you want to guess, but I'm not going to keep you in suspense, ladies and gentlemen. The only thing that's worse is having the government being driven by a bunch of bureaucrats, not of bureaucrats in Washington, but at the national bureaucrats. So they can move that, uh, that area. And, and but one, one other quick aside about FISA. This is Again, as we, my, one of my rejoiners, which I don't know, persuaded many privacy uh, but we talked about about the ability for example, U.S. government, remember, the warrantless surveillance program, DSP, and lots of uh, uh, lots of criticism in, after it got big time. Uh, one of the arguments I, I used to quote was, okay, so you have a U.S. person that's Afghanistan. You know, 
his phone call intercepted. It's terrible violation of privacy. Say to folks, sorry, you realize how many other governments are listening to this? Not burdened by any uh, FISA requirement or any requirement whatsoever. Uh, if somebody's in Pakistan, you know, the Pakistani intelligence, and how capable we are, and like a military, but they're not a little, little moron listening, and Turks are listening, and Saudis are listening. The Tsar, Israelis, they're also listening. So, I mean, the notion that if, if, if only the U.S. government stopped listening to you, you would be enjoying your privacy is absurd. And why are you so worried about the U.S. government listening to you? But not always ever got, never got what I thought was an adequate answer to that. But I thought about that. Uh, yeah, why don't we open yeah. up? Well, I'm not going to monopolize all the questions here. I'll keep going for quite a while. Uh, in the back. Henry Hecker, researcher. Now, there's been talk uh, on the, the web and also on television that they may have to shut down the Internet uh, due to war with Iran if such an event occurred. I, I wondered what your thoughts are on this. Uh, uh, it might be unconstitutional. Uh, is there a way to separate business email from regular informational email? Uh, should this be done so that business can continue within our country uh, in the event of uh, greater hostilities? Well, Really asking a, a, a couple of questions as far as uh, uh, Iran walling itself off. Uh, again, I'm not an engineer. I'll look to my technology betters to tell me if it's technically possible. But uh, I'm old enough to remember the Cold War. I mean, conceptually, this is no different than than uh, Cold War jamming, which was done by the Soviet Union, Cuba, and communist most days was called communist China of. If this was before and that existed of, of radio and, and television. There are ways of working around it to change the frequencies and whatnot. So I don't know if, how easy it is. I suppose they can make it difficult. And I, I remember reading that it's already happening to access certain websites. Um, they're probably. I, I, I would say, look, we should do. Uh, we should make it as difficult as possible for the repressive governments to engage in that kind of behavior the same way as we used to deal with jamming. Uh, there are probably techniques, and again, engineering, but probably techniques to, to work around this. Um, unless I'm missing something, there's nothing unconstitutional about that. I mean, they're a foreign government. Uh, what they're doing is bad, but there's no constitutional right to uh, um, the, the, for foreigners and, uh, outside the United States um, and I know I'm speaking in the face of forgetful litigation for the last, of the last 10 years, but even so, we're talking about things that don't involve U.S. government. So the way other governments deal with their people, while properly an issue of policy and morality, doesn't really have a constitutional dimension. Um, but again, I think we should oppose that technologically, and just like we continue to deal with uh, the folk behind the Iron Curtain. Um, how to separate business and, and private emails? I don't know how you do that, but also I'm a little confused why the protection for, I mean, they're in the, well, let, let me just say this. I don't see any fundamental reasons to do that uh, from a constitutional perspective. I mean, commercial speech is, is regulated a little differently for First Amendment purposes, a little bit more amenable to regulation, but we're not talking about that as far as the, the government's burden to collect it. There's no difference whether it's commercial uh, email or private email. So unless I'm missing something, uh, why, why would you want to do that? But also, how, how be different? You can, you can send an email which says something personal in the first paragraph, and the second paragraph talks about business. Um, uh, next question. Uh, Uh, thank you, Chris Ford here at Hudson Institute. Um, in your remarks, sir, you mentioned the uh, the challenges of some bureaucratic mentality. I think your phrase was uh, in the pre-9/11 era of in problems with information sharing and interagency coordination, that sort of thing. You mentioned that in the context of the wall, for example, within the Department of Justice and that sort of thing. Um, I'd like to ask a question, actually, about this sort of not about the legal impact specifically of the Patriot Act, but about its sort of cultural and political impact within the federal bureaucracy on those kinds of mentality and operational culture 
issues. I had the, the honor of serving as Republican counsel to the Senate Intelligence Committee at the time, and my impression uh, around that time was of the degree to which, at least before 9-11, our uh, security agencies had uh, developed a very powerful culture of stopping well short of what, in fact, where, in fact, they could have stopped and still remained within the bounds of legality. There was, there was absolutely, it wasn't even a question of pushing the envelope of what could be done. It was a question of, of constricting it in a very dramatic way so that as an operational question, you stopped, um, you know, enormously short of what the law might, in fact, have permitted in, in particular crucial respects. And my feeling at the time was, was that the, the biggest impact of the Patriot Act might, in fact, end up being not what it specifically changed as a matter of law and legislation, um, but in fact, of, uh, of its, its impact upon the, the bureaucratic mentality of how the services worked and how government agencies related to each other and that sort of thing. And, um, and I don't, you know, looking, looking at this 10 years on, I'd be very interested in your perspective about this sort of political, cultural, bureaucratic um, impact of the Patriot Act in terms of how it is that our agencies view the challenge of working with each other and view the challenge of going up to the boundaries of what the law permits. Obviously, it's still, it remains as important as ever that we not cross them, but one's approach to that, you know, can be, you can approach that in various different ways, and I'd uh, be interested in your take on how it's an excellent, think that's gone. It's an excellent point. I think it's done that, and really kind of two challenges before. One, and I think you, you mentioned Bob, but let me try to disaggregate them. One is the av aversion to risk-taking, uh, and the wall is a perfect example of it because, again, uh, not the only one, a number of other folks have written uh, about it as, as to how this was a self-inflicted wound, if you will. But that was the mentality. And, and again, look, I spent nine glorious years in the government. I've seen lots of excellent people and mediocre people and some less than that, but I've not seen any evil people. So the reason most things uh, is caution, the risk aversion, particularly as far as pushing to the outer uh, envelope of your legal tools, that was a natural response because, you know, framers understood it very well. Self-interest is, is a, you know, or Adam Smith invisible hand typing is a very powerful motivator of human behavior. It just wasn't worth it. That's not what you're trained to do. So that was not completely disappeared, substantially ameliorated. The second problem, which also got better, is the the clannishness and the silo stuff. Now, again, let's not be idealistic. There is still a fair uh, amount of bureaucratic competition, which, by the way, is a good thing. I call it one, is, one way to do it is bureaucratic inefficiency or suspicions as between the FBI and the CIA, for example, or between the, the, the military component of, of intelligence community and civilian components. You know, again, I'm not telling you anything new. Everybody who reads newspapers know that, you know, Bureau of Intelligence Research within the intelligence community have viewed it so doves would never see a, a, a real serious problem. The military side traditionally has been the most alarmist about the threats and the CIA and somewhere in between. Um, hasn't completely disappeared, and it shouldn't. Now, what I call bureaucratic checks and balances could be a useful thing, but it's gotten better. So both as far as the willingness to use the tools more aggressively as well as working together better um, is it, better. How much of it is attributable, Chris, to the Patriot Act as such versus the atmosphere, the overarching atmosphere, which Patriot Act was a, was a piece, is difficult to, for me to describe it. I mean, another example, uh, remember the military has always talked for years and decades about jointness, and God knows the services have rivalries that are every bit as robust as in the intelligence community, but despite all the reforms and you know, gold over nickels, the best uh, fostering of jointness comes in war, and you have to fight. You kind of get really joined because otherwise you're not going to do very well. Um, so th I, I think we moved in a in a very good direction in that. Um, not a perfect one. Um, I don't think there's such a thing as a perfect uh, integration, um, a perfect willingness to use all the tools. But it's 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 much better. Uh, uh, and it's interesting. I actually think. I mean, we all disagree. Among the public at large, the 9-11 sense level of alarm and concern has largely dissipated, which is why national security is not playing on that much in the elections, in a, in a primary process now. But as far as the political class is concerned and the bureaucratic establishment, it, it hasn't, fortunately, 
uh, lost that appreciation. So uh, I, I think there, things are not quite at the same pitch, and we're worried about the follow-on attacks in the early months post 9-11, but there is still a lot of seriousness. Um, one area, uh, however, sort of where you know, only have a jarring or contrary impulse I can think about is, you remember all the debates about interrogations? Um, and again, it shows you how in a democracy people respond to incentives. I will tell you that not only, uh, you know, whether, uh, not only have we taken legally the option of uh, enhanced interrogations off the table, which we have, by and large, but we've taken it practically off the table because I cannot think about any interrogator that would be willing to do that, no matter what orders he or she gets, because if you look at what happened with people who've been involved in those programs, uh, even tangential. Um, now, God forbid if we get hit again, you, you know, the pendulum might swing in the other direction, but uh, the, the interrogation is and I, I'm, when I'm talking about interrogation, make sure we understand it's human interrogation, not electronic you know, surveillance. Um, but that, that's one notable exception. But again, validates your broader point. People respond to political, bureaucratic, and, and, and legal infrastructure tweaks. Um, hi, my name is uh, John Rosato. I'm with the... Uh, United States Postal Service, actually, and um, one used thing to I want—I uh, used to play an important part in that. I know, right? <laughs> um, what I want to ask you is—is is you touched on it briefly, but then you, you didn't—you sort of moved away from it in your remarks on. So, with internet companies or, or entities that maintain large commercial websites that have transactions going on all the time, um, it's one thing to say if you get subpoenaed through, say, a national security letter or whatever for the records of an individual. It's another when we're talking about, say, a large group that's not specifically defined by name, but more about demographic or something like that. What are the powers right now under the Patriot Act or under other laws for the government to request information like that from Google, from Amazon, from USPS, for instance? Very difficult to talk about this um, in the aggregate um, of our <laughs> at unclassified level. Um, I would just say, and, and by the way, I'm, I've been involved in this for a number of years. Uh, in in, uh, but my sense is that we have an ability to seek. Um, and again, you have to be careful. But I don't know if there's anything postal office specific. But as far as electronic providers are concerned, I'm using the term advisedly. There is an ability to seek group data. How? Precisely, that works. To what extent, you know, it's described with particularity. I mean, one thing it, it certainly I'll tell you that, that's pretty well known. It's all driven now for revised FISA, so uh, um, you know, it, it's not a, it, it's not driven by the executive branch on its own any own authority. And there have been some dumbing down. Again, I mean, people like Judge McKenzie and others have spoken about this publicly. There have been some dumbing down of a capability. But it's very important, and again, they put it much better than I can. Uh, why is it important? Because if you are an intelligence business or counterintelligence business, you want to look for footprints in the snow, for dots that connect. If you already know who the person is, that's kind of fairly late in the game. And to the extent you know who a person is, you want to know everybody else that person is talking to or communicating. Um, so, or you may, you know, feel that there is a particular communication mode, a particular location um, that is interesting because the bad guys are used. So there, there are things that can be done. Uh, I know that this is a big bugaboo for the privacy crats who think that all orders and, and all government collection efforts should be individual specific, but that's, that's kind of crazy. But... I, it's interesting. I did not don't know if there's anything postal office specific uh, out there. Uh, yeah, uh, gentleman here and then the lady. The lady. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mark Granis from Wilshire and Granis. Um, 
you started off framing this in in the two in terms of the 2001 events and the 2001 debate right um but i want to ask about things that have changed since then sort of around the the patriot act and see what your thoughts are on those um you poke a little fun at the library cards and at people in foreign countries who are, who aren't worried about what the foreign governments are doing in, in reading their mail but one view of all of the privacy protections is not that they're for the modest, but that they're instrumentally very important in constraining power in our own government. And since 2001, we've seen not just people getting you know, your library records, but now we see after that warrantless wiretapping became known. And then we found that we could take US citizens who were subject to judicial process and under the, the jurisdiction of the courts and have them sent to Briggs. And then more recently we've seen that the military can now detain people without charges indefinitely and the government can actually execute US citizens without trial anywhere on a battlefield and the battlefield is the globe. So, um, so I wonder whether the arguments for the Patriot Act, or the, I'm sorry, the arguments against the Patriot Act might actually be stronger today than they were 10 years ago because of what the government now claims the right to do with the information. And whether you think that you do justice to those arguments by continuing to talk about this issue in historical terms. Understood. Um, I think it's important to look at the record, not only uh, as where, you're right, where things stood at, uh, as of 9-11, which is an extraordinary event, and led to all this institutional legal reshuffling, legal reshuffling, but look at it now. I see, however, what has happened with 9-11 different. First of all, despite the best efforts, plus all that performance change for Chris, despite all the checks and balance, because one of the things, it's not just the media that ferrets out, but I guess my bottom line would be there was remarkably little wrongdoing by the government. Now, maybe I define wrongdoing different than you do, but let me just run with it for a second. Remarkably little wrongdoing. No evidence at all that any information gathered has been misused for private purposes and rogue intelligence agents learning something, black men something, using it to advantage. How do we know that? We always, always say that absence of something doesn't prove it, it doesn't exist. But we have the most robust institutional checks and balances where it goes views within the community. Who do you think leaks things to reporters? Because the people on the inside would have known how to learn about it. There's been a remarkable absence. There have been some sloppiness with regard to uh, NSLs in particular, uh, but remarkable absence of it. That's, that's a great thing about our government. Uh, maybe I'm naive, but as I said, 30 or 40 years there, but I've just never seen really bad people. Um, now, you can say to me, but that's trivial, Mr. So, in, no intelligence agent misused something for personal purpose. But what does the government do with this information? Well, first of all, let's walk through it. The, the power to execute. The loaded term, I don't think the government claims the power to execute anybody. The government claims the power to use deadly force against individuals it believes to be in a combat, but in judicial review. But it's not new. That's been with us from history of warfare. The judiciary never involved in any decision relating to the use of deadly force in the context of an armed conflict. It's not the case in the Revolutionary War. American judiciary is the case. Certainly uh, during the Civil War is a case in every conflict in, in, in which armed forces were used. So there's nothing remarkable about that. Uh, and the fact that that power is used against U.S. citizens, there's also nothing remarkable about that. The laws of war are absolutely clear that you don't have any special right if you're an enemy combatant because you happen to be a U.S. citizen. That's the teaching of, of a party queer. And there's nice language that basically says it does not matter. It's one of a, we know for sure it's one of the dramatic persona in queer, uh, a case involving German saboteurs with a U.S. citizen. So no, nothing changed. I mean, forgive me for putting it the, the, perhaps overly aggressively, the critics often don't remember their history. Um, you know, lots of, for example, I, I uh, was confronted, not in, in your case, who claims American government never used deadly force against U.S. citizens on American soil. It's like, what do you think happened in the Civil War? 
I mean, dozens of thousands of people, all whom are U.S. citizens, were killed on battlefields in U.S. soil without any judicial imprimatur, and lots and lots of them, thousands and thousands of both sides, were rotting in prisons of war camps, including some you know, very unsanitary hulks sitting in, in, in New York Harbor. Um, nobody got any habeas corpus. So none of it is new. And you cannot fight a war. How are you going to fight a war? If you're going to judicial imprimatur, be use of deadly force, where you, if you plunge a bayonet in somebody's belly, so it'd be gross, or throw a grenade, or fire a machine gun, or, or drop a bomb, or a missile, you're supposed to get a judicial warrant. That's, that's crazy. So that's not new. Um, what else has the government done? Well, the government now, under the Revised Patriot Act and Revised FISA, collects information without some of a handicap, and that has led to remarkable successes on the part of our counterintelligence. And you think about, I don't know precise numbers, but dozens of plots, for it, dozens, before, and, and, and you know, some of them, we could say, were not serious. You know, you read this guy was wearing a suicide belt that was a dummy belt because you know, he was spotted early on and rode by the FBI. That's a good thing. I mean, I would rather people who are proceeding along this path be given a dummy suicide belt than they go and construct the real one and kill themselves, if only themselves, uh, um, or, or other people. So these are, I don't see abuses. I don't see either abuses at the individual level or, or, or governmental level. And the final thing about library records, it's not about, to make an obvious point, it's not about whether one reads Lolita. Ten times, or you know, Playboy. It's about whether. Remember, we're talking about people who get recruited now and indoctrinated entirely on the net. It, so it's not like you even go to, for training somewhere. So if somebody checks out every treatise on explosive making, how you transform fertilizer uh, into an explosive, that's kind of a useful to know. I mean, I, maybe it chills this person's privacy a little bit, but. I mean, wouldn't you want to know? I mean, that's really what the government is looking for. Or if you, I mean, to use a law enforcement analogy, if you're, if you're you know, studying every treatise there is about how to break into banks and disable their alarm system, that's kind of, that's not enough to, you know, charge you of anything, but it certainly can bring you to the attention of a government and warrant some further investigation. Again, full set of checks and balances with both congressional oversight and judiciary engagement. Judiciary is very much involved. FISA judges are Article Three judges. They're not some patsy. But what am I missing? Is there some wrongdoing that, I mean, aside from the, you know, all of Lockheed type situations, which were never driven by judiciary? Uh, no, I Wait, 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 we didn't declare, I mean, uh, forgive me for, wait, wait, wait. Well, forgive me, I'm, I'm a serious, I'm a serious student of the Constitution. Nobody can declare martial law by Congress. I don't know of anybody who claims that the executive can declare martial law. What, what language are we talking about? What, what does it, forgive me, what does it say? Well, forgive me, it, I, I would believe that the president, there is language relating to circumstances which the president can, can take control of the National Guard. I don't believe it says can impose martial law. If you, I, I would be happy to, to look at it, but he cannot say that because the president most emphatically does not have a power to impose martial law. As far as taking control of the National Guard, if you forget him in 9-11, you look at things like Katrina. There can be circumstances where the president can do that. That's not martial law. Martial law has a totally different constitutional pedigree means totally different things, including their uh, uh, abolition of habeas corpus. And remember, the government never argued that the reason habeas corpus was not appropriate for Guantanamo-based folks is because we won the martial law. 
the government argued that the Constitution did not apply to Guantanamo, Guantanamo not being part of the United States and we're dealing with foreign nationals. So under, in, in those days, considered to be binding Supreme Court jurisprudence. So I, I don't, but I, I'll, I'll check. If, if it says martial law, that would stun the hell out of me. Over here. Look, one more thing. Things ebb and flow in a democracy as they should. If a government misbehaves in a fundamental way, not only is it going to pay a political price, it's going to pay an institutional price because laws would be yanked back. On the other hand, we should not allow hypothetical concerns to hamstring us just because things might happen. So the pendulum should swing based upon real events that transpire, not, not the possibility. Okay. Hi, my name is Mary Carrick. Um, I, getting to this whole idea of like terrorists, um, I've been reading numerous reports that the government is eavesdropping through the internet or the phone of just everyday average Americans. And I've read numerous reports that the Department of Homeland Security has deemed groups of Americans that would not be groups usually that would be associated with terrorism as potential domestic terrorists. Um, black people, uh, gun owners, people who buy gold, people who are against abortion, Ron Paul supporters, um, and people who pay for things with cash. And I just would like to s see what your opinion on that is. Well, out of respect, I don't think the facts are to describe them. Uh, I think there are, and it was early in, the, in this administration, there are some reports that the, uh, the policy planning unit of, uh, of a DHS uh, was looking at other groups other than Al-Qaeda and, and uh, affiliated entities. And by the way, I don't begrudge them right to the extent. Oh, wait, oh, the important thing, it's not about being a gun owner. It's not about being against abortion. It's not about, you know, uh, not being a fan of a, of a current administration. It's about being a part uh, of a movement that engages in violent actions against the government and the American people. I mean, you know, again, it pains me to say that, but, you know, Oklahoma City was not perpetrated by Al-Qaeda, perpetrated by, you know, uh, a white supremacist, crazy guy. So we want the government to be looking at such groups, tightly defined. It would amaze me, and especially since the House flipped in <laughs> 2008, if this administration really was looking at the gun owners, a writ large, or people who oppose abortion writ large, it would have you know, crossed their license and uh, and his colleagues to make a big uh, ado about it. it could be. So I just don't think it's happening. Um, but again, looking at, at violent domestic extremism is, is again, within proper bounds, subject to checks and balances in accordance with existing legal authorities. We don't want the government to be, not to be doing that. Um, and, and finally, about business about paying cash. Well, they look, not sure how, <laughs> how the government would track that, but uh, one of the things that really changed since 9-11, and you cannot fail but notice it every time you engage in banking transactions, they, there's a lot of new new reporting requirements. Actually, that's something I do work on for a living. I represent some banks, and there's a lot of new requirements about how transactions uh, are reported. There's new emphasis on, on uh, punishing the so-called structuring, which is you know, breaking your deposits into bite-sized chunks, typically below $10,000 to avoid reporting. Why is that? Because, again, money is the sinew. The sinew is the wrong analogy. is the blood of the terrorism. You cannot buy stuff. You know, you, you in, get to the United States legally, illegally, if you're going to launch uh, operations, the thing about 9-11 conspirators, all of them had to spend money. Go oh, take lessons in aviation school, remember? The guys who say stupidly, I don't think it would be that stupid now, but they wanted to learn how to take off, but didn't necessarily worry about learning how to land. You got to pay to go to aviation school. You got to pay to rent apartments. You got to pay to buy fertilizer. You got to you know, pay to rent trucks. So looking at unusual expenditures, patterns of expenditures, is a good way of, of you know, 
connecting the dots early on. We want them to do it. And Gelman, frankly, has, again, written up many times, very sophisticated algorithms that can look at the totality of transactions and, and see, you know, reduce the pool of people they need to take a look at, at, at a little bit closer. I know it sounds very sinister. I'm going to take a look at this. But we want them to do it, unless we just want to sit back and get hit again. But I, again, I don't think any of it is sinister. Uh, with respect, but this is something I guess people can disagree. Let's take one last question, the lady over here. On the side. Thank you. I am Nini Sharikin, independent writer. With the revelation of the reasons happening in New York and uh, New Jersey about the spying and the snooping of uh, NYPD with the blessing of uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, you know, to the Muslim community, professors and students, uh, and this is very extensive. And I, I, I want to understand, is this also the extension of the Patriotic Act? Thank extension you. of Patriot Act? Patriot, Patriot, Patriot Act, yeah. Um, no, but I would say this. <laughs> we have enormous safeguards in place uh, that prevent unauthorized snooping or, you know, activities that might be, you know, disrespectful of any community in this country. In fact, quite candidly, you, may, you probably wouldn't agree with me. But I cannot think with respect about any country in history that having been attacked the way we were in 9-11 has eschewed any jingoism or virtually any jingoism, any harassment, not even governmental, but at the level of the people, that has not treated the community, Muslim communities, with enormous respect, with enormous solicitude. Now... Are there no investigations that are directed at particular individuals of Muslim faith? Of course there are. But just like being a Christian is not a, a shield against being investigated by the government, why, why should being a Muslim is a, is a shield against being investigated? But again, it's done with tremendous amount of caution and, and, and sensitivity. And the business about uh, the NYPD and other major police departments investigating, that's not some kind of a unauthorized rogue thing. Remember I said earlier on in my remarks that one of the things that has happened was better coordination both within the federal government and between the federal government and state and local law enforcement agencies. And very well known that several large metropolitan police departments, with New York being the most prominent one, have you know, dedicated counterintelligence capabilities, very sophisticated ones with some of the people stationed overseas. So, you know, per permanence of cross-training with the FBI and other intelligence agencies. That's a good thing. I mean, wh why would a city like New York that's been the target of 9-11 and has been a target of a previous World Trade Center attack, and, and, and it probably looms number one on every terrorist list. If you lived in New York, why would you want your police department to, you know, within the bounds of a law and procedure to to, in to investigate those things, to help which, after all, FBI has a finite resources, and they're not, you know, there's a big FBI office, field office in New York, but and they have a, a whole country to worry about. So I don't see it as a bad thing, and I don't know of any abuses uh, that have come to light uh, in New York or New York. With that, we'll close it out, and if you have any questions, we can. Thank you very much.